benvinguts socis i sòcies, recercadors i recercadores, companyes i companys. Benvingut Alberto, primer guardonat del Premi Taula de Canvi. És un honor donar-vos la benvinguda a la cerimònia d'entrega del Premi Taula de Canvi de la Societat Catalana d'Economia, que avui s'entrega a Alberto Martín, investigador sènior del Centre de Recerca en Economia Internacional, CREI, catedràtic a la Universitat Pompeu Fabra i professor d'investigació a la Barcelona School of Economics. Abans de passar a la lectura de l'acte, el lliurament del premi i la lliçó magistral del professor Martín, tenim el goig i l'honor de comptar amb en Pere Verdés Pijuan, doctor en Història Medieval i investigador del CSIC. La línia de recerca principal d'en Pere Verdés és la història de la fiscalitat i les finances municipals a Catalunya durant la baixa edat mitjana, incluent de manera especial l'estudi de la creació, el desenvolupament i les repercussions socials, polítiques i econòmiques de les institucions financeres del nostre país. És, per tant, la persona més indicada per explicar-nos breument els orígens de la taula de canvi, el primer banc públic d'Europa. Moltes gràcies. Bé, bona tarda a tothom i gràcies, Ada, per haver-me convidat a aquest acte de lliurament de la primera edició del Premi Taula de Canvi. Com a historiador, el motiu de la meva presència aquí és donar unes breus pinzellades sobre la institució que dona nom al Premi. Personalment, crec que ha estat un encert escollir aquest nom, ja que es tracta d'una institució històrica realment original dins del panorama europeu. I no només això, sense caure en xovinismes, penso que la taula constitueix també una clara mostra del precós desenvolupament econòmic i financer del nostre país. Per força, les meves consideracions han de ser breus, ja que avui el que ens reuneix aquí no és la història, sinó la recerca sobre l'economia actual, tot i que, com veurem, hi poden haver alguns paral·lelismes. Bàsicament, per saber el que va ser i entendre la importància de la taula de canvi, s'ha de tenir en compte tres qüestions. En primer lloc, cal preguntar-se per què es va crear aquesta institució. En segon lloc, evidentment, hem de recordar quines van ser les principals característiques. I per últim, val la pena explicar per què se la considera el primer banc públic d'Europa. Pel que fa a les raons que expliquen la creació de la taula de canvi, la principal va ser l'enorme deute públic creat a Catalunya ja al segle XIV. Com saben, a partir del segle XIII, Catalunya i l'antiga Corona d'Aragó van esdevenir una potència política i econòmica a la Mediterrània. Aquest poder, tanmateix, va tenir un cost i sobte que un territori relativament petit, tan petit com la Corona, fos capaç d'assumir-lo i d'enfrontar-se amb altres potències molt més riques i poderoses. Una de les explicacions d'aquest fet, potser la principal, és l'existència d'un deute públic que, com deien les autoritats de Girona a començaments del segle XV al rei, era l'arma de guerra més poderosa que tenia. Crec que no exageraven aquestes autoritats, ja que la monarquia havia pogut fer front a les primeres conquestes del segle XIII, amb els seus recursos propis i recorrent puntualment als seus súbdits. Durant el segle XIV, però, les arques del rei estaven totalment aixutes i el rei va haver de recórrer a les ciutats i a les assemblees generals, a les corts, per aconseguir els diners que li permetessin finançar les inacabables campanyes militars en què es va veure implicada la corona. Aquestes enormes sumes de capital, a més, s'havien d'aconseguir de manera ràpida, de manera que no hi havia temps material per recaptar els impostos, ni tan sols amb la intervenció dels primers banquers privats, molts dels quals van fer fallida. Davant d'aquest fet, des de mitjan segle XIV, es va començar a emetre uns títols de deute que, com deveu saber alguns de vosaltres, s'anomenaven sense els morts i violaris. Es tractava de rendes perpètues i vitalícies, venudes per part primer de les ciutats i després de les assemblees de corts a uns interessos molt més reduïts que els del crèdit jueu, que habitualment era usurari. Aquestes rendes no estaven garantides per cap bé concret, sinó en general per la capacitat econòmica present i futura de la persona física o jurídica que les creava. Es tractava, per tant, de deute de tipus personal, que en el cas de les ciutats o les assemblees estava avalat per 
el conjunt de persones que constituïa la comunitat política. Gràcies a aquestes operacions, els municipis es van aconseguir consolidar com a tals i també va néixer la Diputació del General, la Generalitat, que inicialment no era altra cosa que l'organisme encarregat de pagar el deute contret per la totalitat del país. D'aquí crec que es pugui considerar com a deute públic. Aquest deute era molt llarg termini i va tenir un èxit impressionant. Va amarar tota la societat. Això no vol dir, però, que no hi haguessin dificultats. Ara bé, les autoritats de l'època van ser capaces de crear un entramat institucional que va atorgar una gran seguretat jurídica al sistema fins al punt que va perviure fins, com a mínim, a la guerra de successió i als decrets de nova planta. A grans trets es pot considerar que aquesta seguretat se sustentava sobre tres pilars. L'un, la legislació general promulgada a les Corts i garantida per la Generalitat, protegint, és molt important, els interessos dels creditors. L'altre, l'aval de l'Església, que era un dels principals creditors, precisament, que va acabar amb qualsevol ombra d'usura que pesés sobre aquest tipus de crèdit. I el tercer, i el que ens interessa, el paper de la ciutat de Barcelona, que era capital econòmica i financera de Catalunya. Com es pot suposar, aquesta capitalitat econòmica de Barcelona va ser fonamental, ja que constituïa el mitjà de coerció definitiu contra qualsevol que no respectés les normes legals o morals. Ara bé, perquè Barcelona pogués exercir aquest paper, calia que les finances de les ciutats fossin sòlides, i aquí és on entra la taula de canvi. Durant la segona meitat del segle XIV, Barcelona s'havia endeutat de forma molt important i tal com va passar a altres llocs o institucions, les autoritats del Consell de Cent van haver de prendre mesures per controlar aquest deute. Concretament, l'any 1400, un grup de ciutadans va proposar la creació d'una taula de dipòsits amb el propòsit de reduir l'endeutament municipal i no dependre tant d'aquest. El 19 de gener de 1401, el Consell General de la Ciutat, reunit a les grades del Palau Reial, ja nomenava procuradors per tal d'assegurar, en nom de tots els ciutadans barcelonins, els diners que s'ingressessin a la taula municipal. Neixia d'aquesta manera la institució, que seria el lloc on es dipositarien obligatòriament tots els capitals immobilitzats per ordres judicials o tutelats per l'administració de la ciutat. Òbviament, també s'hi van ingressar els recursos municipals, que eren immensos, així com els diners que qualsevol persona o institució desitgés que hi fossin custodiats. La taula no pagava interessos ni prestava diners a particulars. La seva principal missió era proporcionar liquiditat al municipi, a cost zero, per reduir el deute o fer front a qualsevol altra necessitat sense necessitat d'emetre més rendes. La iniciativa va ser tot un èxit i ben aviat individus privats, inclosos banquers, institucions de tot tipus, rei, generalitat, nobles, església, van ingressar els seus capitals a la taula. Ho feien pel simple fet de la seguretat que els oferia i per l'oportunitat de poder fer còmodament transferències entre comptes. Per controlar aquests moviments i permetre el funcionament de la institució, el Consell nomenava periòdicament uns escrivans encarregats de portar la comptabilitat, uns pesadors que comprovaven la qualitat de la moneda ingressada, és a dir, la quantitat de metall preciós, i uns vestaixos, uns servents, que tenien la comesa de transportar la moneda, els llibres de compte i altres objectes des de la llotja, que és on operava habitualment la taula, fins a la casa de la ciutat. Per cert, en deien taula perquè, igual que feien els financers particulars, les operacions amb moneda o a compte es feien a una taula física, una taula física, coberta amb unes tovalloles de vellut on hi havia l'escut de la ciutat. Gràcies a aquesta iniciativa, Barcelona va aconseguir equilibrar les seves finances i, de retruc, va donar estabilitat al sistema financer de tot el país. Val a dir que això no va ser senzill, no va ser fàcil, ni va estar exempt de dificultats. La primera es va produir ben aviat i va ser provocada pels excessius préstecs que la pròpia ciutat sol·licitava a la taula. Per solucionar el problema, durant la primera meitat del segle XV, es van promulgar ordinacions que podríem comparar amb lleis pressupostàries, és a dir, que establien els ingressos i les despeses, de forma precisa, que cada any podia fer el municipi, comptant el deute que s'havia d'anar amortitzant progressivament. El segon problema, més important, va ser provocat per la Guerra Civil, 
catalana que entre 1462 i 1472 va enfrontar el rei Joan II amb les institucions del Principat encapçalades, com no podia ser d'altra manera, per la ciutat de Barcelona. Tal com ens diu un cronista de l'època, al començament d'aquest conflicte, els catalans, que ja aleshores eren famosos per ser estalviadors, ja ho diu el mateix cronista, van dir-li al rei que de diners per fer la guerra els en sobraven i que si volien podien construir sobre el mar i aplanar qualsevol muntanya. D'on van sortir els diners? Doncs de la taula de canvi, que l'any 1468 va fer suspensió de pagaments. Afortunadament, després de la guerra, la institució va recuperar-se en bona mesura gràcies als successius privilegis reials, això és durant tota l'època moderna, que garantien la seguretat dels dipòsits particulars contra qualsevol tipus de confiscació, inclòs el propi rei. I trencaven el vincle, un vincle massa estret, que existia entre la tresoreria municipal i la caixa de la taula. Bé, no em puc estendre amb més notícies ni detalls i per acabar només em resta apuntar breument la raó per la qual la taula de canvi és considerada com el primer banc públic d'Europa. Com he dit, no es tracta de portar a la qüestió el terreny del xurinisme, ja que hi van haver institucions coetànies i posteriors a l'Occident Europeu molt més importants que la taula. Tanmateix, crec que és de justícia reconèixer la seva precocitat i transcendència dins del panorama europeu històric i econòmic internacional. De fet, es podria parlar d'una tradició particular de bancs públics creats a imatge de la taula de canvi. Durant el segle XV, a banda de Barcelona, també documentem temptatives, sense èxit, totes elles, de crear aquest tipus d'institucions a Mallorca, a Perpinyà, a València, a Tarragona o a Girona. I posteriorment, durant els segles XVI i XVII, sí que van quallar i en trobem a València, Mallorca, Tarragona, Vic, Tortosa, Lleida o Cervera, per exemple. Ara bé, la transcendència d'aquestes institucions no va ser ni molt menys la mateixa que la taula de canvi. En contrapartida, en canvi, sí que és molt important l'anomenada Casa de Sant Giorgio, fundada l'any 1407 a Gènova. La potència d'aquesta institució era molt gran, explica l'expansió de la República Genovesa. Ara bé, es tracta d'un model totalment diferent al de la taula, ja que la seva base era empresarial i seria més aviat comparable a les companyies de les Índies Orientals holandeses o angleses que es van fundar al segle XVII. També a Itàlia són cèlebres els anomenats Monti, especialment aquells de caràcter pietos que es van crear durant la segona meitat del segle XV a llocs com Perugia, Màntua o Florència. Però aquestes institucions que s'escamparien per tota Europa durant època moderna eren així mateix diferents de la taula i molt posteriors a aquesta. No és estrany, per tant, que els historiadors reconeguin la precocitat de la institució que dona nom al premi i sense voler comparar-la amb els posteriors bancs nacionals, amb el banc d'Amsterdam de 1609 o el d'Anglaterra de 1694, la situen a l'inici, al començament de la banca pública. I res més, gràcies per la vostra atenció. Moltes gràcies, Pere, per les paraules i les instruccions, les lliçons que ens has donat. I ara passarem a llegir l'acte del jurat. Bon vespre. Acte de la reunió del jurat del Premi Taula de Canvi. Divendres 2 de desembre de 2022, a la sala Fons Seré de l'Institut d'Estudis Catalans, a les 6 de la tarda, a reunir el jurat del Premi Taula de Canvi composat per Andreu Mascolell com a president del jurat, Xavier Vives, Marta Reinal Carol, Jaume Ventura, Inés Macho Stadler, Pol Entràs, que assistí des de Boston als Estats Units per via telemàtica. Joaquim P. Ramon, secretari tresorer de la Societat Catalana d'Economia, actuar com a secretari sense vot. D'acord amb les bases del Premi, les candidatures al Premi podien ser proposades per les institucions de caràcter públic o privat vinculades a la recerca econòmica, un o més socis de la Societat Catalana d'Economia, així com el Comitè de Nominacions establert per la Junta de Govern de la Societat Catalana d'Economia. El nombre de candidats, tots ells satisfent les bases del Premi, ha estat de set. Podent haver conflicte d'interessos, cas que algun membre del tribunal treballés a la mateixa institució que algun candidat, s'havia establert que en aquest cas 
el membre del tribunal s'abstindria en les votacions que el poguessin afectar. Amb aquestes consideracions, la reunió s'inicià puntualment a les 6 amb una intervenció del president, del jurat, que manifestà la intenció de demanar a la Junta de Govern de la Societat Catalana d'Economia, primer, que el premi sigui anual i no bianual, i segon, que la Junta sigui major en el futur, el percentatge de professors de fora de Catalunya per a reduir el risc d'incompatibilitats. Ningú manifestà cap objecció i s'inicià la discussió sobre els mèrits dels candidats. Aquesta va incloure diverses votacions, sempre amb l'abstenció dels membres que podien estar afectats per la incompatibilitat. A la fi, s'escollí per unanimitat Alberto Martín com a guanyador del Premi Taula de Canvi. Els mèrits són els següents. El professor Alberto Martín va obtenir el seu doctorat a la Universitat de Colúmbia l'any 2005. Actualment és investigador sènior del Centre de Recerca en Economia Internacional, el CREI, catedràtic a la Universitat Pompeu Fabra i professor d'investigació a la Barcelona School of Economics. Ha ocupat càrrecs al Banc Central Europeu, al Fons Monetari Internacional i al Ministeri d'Economia Argentí. Per al seu treball ha estat guardonat amb la beca Lanfalussi del Banc Central Europeu i tres beques d'investigació del Consell Europeu de Recerca, dels ERC Grants. És un investigador de gran prestigi internacional amb treballs de gran impacte acadèmic i rellevància pràctica. A la segona meitat dels anys 2000, el professor Martín va desenvolupar una teoria que enfatitza el paper dels mercats secundaris en la sostenibilitat del deute sobirà. Aquest exercici, inicialment teòric, va resultar crucial per entendre la crisi del deute a Europa del 2010-2012. D'acord amb la seva teoria, el deute de països com Espanya, Itàlia, Portugal i Irlanda va ser recomprat per institucions financeres d'aquests països, reduint la probabilitat d'impagaments i enfortint aquestes economies. El professor Martín va posar en pràctica aquesta recerca durant una estada de dos anys al Fons Monetari Internacional, on va servir com a membre d'un grup de treball sobre la reestructuració del deute sobirà. El professor Martín també va desenvolupar a finals dels anys 2000 i principis dels 2010 una nova teoria de bombolles especulatives que detalla els mecanismes mitjançant els quals aquests fenòmens generen cicles econòmics reals. Un aspecte innovador del seu treball és la demostració que aquests cicles no són necessàriament el resultat del comportament irracional dels mercats. Els seus models han ajudat a entendre el paper de les polítiques fiscals i monetàries en la gestió de les bombolles especulatives. El professor Martín va utilitzar els resultats de la seva recerca durant una estada de dos anys al Banc Central Europeu, on va participar en l'elaboració de l'estratègia de política monetària i financera del banc. Més enllà d'aquestes contribucions, el professor Martín ha estudiat temes d'economia internacional i macroeconomia tan variats i rellevants com el disseny d'acords de comerç internacional, el càlcul dels multiplicadors fiscals o l'anàlisi dels efectes de les institucions europees sobre el nivell de la despesa pública. Finalment, els membres del jurat volen deixar constància que el nivell de les candidatures presentades ha estat molt alt i que esperen que moltes d'elles siguin novament presentades en futures edicions. Amb l'exposició de mèrits i la síntesi de l'acte se'n farà una nota divulgativa en la que es constati la independència del jurat i la pulcritud de l'elecció i signa l'acte a l'anterior secretari tresorer, el meu antecessor, Joaquim Parramon Aiza, secretari del jurat del Premi. Moltes gràcies. I enhorabona. Moltes gràcies. Doncs, ara hem de... Jordi, no vols col·laborar? Perquè és una escultura molt i molt bonica. I jo puc dir-ho perquè com que no l'he escollit jo ni l'he dissenyat jo, no passa res perquè ho digui. I la taula de canvi. Enhorabona. Enhorabona. Després de... Quan acabis la teva lliçó, anunciarem la propera convocatòria del Premi Taula de Canvi, però primer penso que és més adequat si vols fer la teva presentació. I ara l'Alberto Martín ens farà la seva lliçó magistral, que es diu Macroeconomics in Times of Low Interest Rates, Bubbles, Debts and Resource Misallocation. Pots anar allà i... Alberto, volies... 
Bona tarda. La presentació la faré en anglès, però abans de la presentació vull dir unes paraules. Estimats col·legues, amics i autoritats de la Societat Catalana d'Economia, és un gran honor per a mi ser el primer guardonat del Premi Taula de Canvi de la Societat Catalana d'Economia. Estic profundament agraït per aquest reconeixement i especialment orgullós donada la qualitat acadèmica del jurat. Com sol passar, aquest premi no és del tot meu, sinó també de tots els que m'han acompanyat en el camí. Agraeixo sobretot a la meva dona, Florència, ja que fa gairebé 30 anys m'acompanya en les meves aventures laborals i de vida. Però també agraeixo enormement als meus col·legues del CREI, una institució increïble a la qual vaig tenir la sort d'unir-me quan vaig acabar el meu doctorat a la Universitat de Colúmbia. No és fàcil construir una institució acadèmica d'excel·lència que sigui acollidora pels joves. Requereix, sobretot, tenir investigadors sèniors que prediquin amb l'exemple, que tinguin l'ambició necessària per fer recerca de primer nivell mundial, però també la disposició i generositat d'ajudar els seus col·legues més joves. Tot això ho vaig trobar jo al CREI i em vaig beneficiar enormement. No sé si avui soc un bon economista, però una cosa és segura, seria molt pitjor del que soc si no fos per la interacció amb els meus col·legues al llarg de tots aquests anys. Espero jo també haver contribuït a l'excel·lència de la institució i seguir fent-ho mentre segueixi sent investigador del CREI. Vull recalcar dos aspectes adicionals del premi que em fan molt feliç. El primer és que reconeix una línia de recerca que m'apassiona sobre crisis financieres, bombolles especulatives i crisis de deute. Jo soc argentí i aquests temes em van interessar tota la vida. De fet, jo volia ser economista per entendre les crisis i, sobretot, per entendre com evitar-les. Volia fer el doctorat i tornar a Argentina a fer política econòmica. No vaig mai imaginar-me que acabaria fent recerca, la qual em semblava molt lenta, avorrida i lluny del fragó quotidià de la política econòmica. Però un imprevist del destí ha canviat els meus plans. Quan vaig arribar a la Universitat de Colúmbia no hi havia macroeconomistes interessats en aquests temes. És per aquesta raó que vaig treballar amb economistes teòrics, com el Paolo Siconolfi i el John Genacoplos, i ells van canviar profundament la meva forma d'entendre la investigació. Per sobre totes les coses, tots dos s'entenien la importància de les idees. Em recordo que el Paolo, que havia sigut simpatitzant d'Esquerra en la seva joventut i venia de l'estadística, em va dir un dia, quan era estudiant de doctorat, el primer teorema del benestar va ser una experiència intel·lectual demolidora. Amb un parell de supòsits i una gran elegància va destruir tot el que creia. Em va prendre anys recuperar-me. Jo vaig pensar, uau, aquest tio es pren les idees seriosment. En la meva tesi vaig treballar sobre problemes de selecció adversa i les seves implicacions per entendre la crisi financiera. Però els macroeconomistes acadèmics encara no estaven molt interessats en aquests temes. Més d'una vegada m'han dit, potser això és important per al teu país d'origen, però no és rellevant per les economies avançades. Per sort, va arribar la crisi del 2008, que va canviar aquesta creència per sempre i li va donar un gran impuls a la meva carrera. No obstant això, en el CREI sempre vaig trobar interès en aquests temes. Us explico una anècdota del meu primer seminari al CREI. Vaig presentar el meu job market paper i vaig esmentar al passar que l'existència de selecció adversa en els mercats financers podia deprimir els tipus d'interès i obrir la porta a l'existència de bombolles especulatives. No sé si el Jaume ho recorda, però aquest resultat el va tornar boig. A causa d'aquest comentari vam parlar de bombolles durant gran part del dinar i després, quan volia convencer-me de venir al CREI, em deia Alberto, vine, que escriurem molts papers de bombolles junts. Bé, ho vam fer. Ara us explicaré una mica sobre què tracten tots aquests papers. Abans de fer-ho, vull mencionar el segon aspecte d'aquest premi que em fa especialment feliç, aquest reconeixement de la Societat Catalana d'Economia em fa sentir encara més barceloní. Fa molts anys que visc en aquesta ciutat, li tinc una profunda estima, he fet aquí la meva recerca, he criat aquí els meus tres fills, he fet grans amistats i últimament, fins i tot, pateixo molt amb el Barça. Moltes gràcies, de veritat.
la presentación la haré en inglés. Uh, you can interrupt me whenever you want, ask questions, and stop me whenever. So, let me, um, you, you'll keep the time, by the way, please. So, what I'm going to do here is try to give you an overview of all these papers that were mentioned uh, in, the, um, in the statement and kind of give you an overview of why I think this research is important and how it can help us understand uh, the world we live in, okay? So some of you already know this, but uh, once again, we can interact, you can stop me, whenever. But, oh, here. So the motivation for many of these papers, I'm gonna spend a lot of time on the bubbles and then I'll switch to public debt. Okay, but the motivation for many of these papers is exactly the type of events that you see here. These are three pictures that show uh, three series for Spain. The top one is the net worth over GDP for the Spanish economy. Okay, this net worth, basically you can think of it as the value of all assets in the Spanish economy, uh, housing and equity, basically. And what you can see here, I don't know if, yeah, what you can see here is that from the late 90s to 2008, right before the crisis, there was, of course, a huge increase in this net worth for Spain. We see there that this goes up from 4.5 to 8.5. So this is four GDPs of wealth created in a very rapid time. Okay, what's happening in the background? Housing prices and equity prices are rising very rapidly. The second picture is the current account of Spain. And you can see that it's like the mirror image of the top. As asset prices are rising, the current account deficit is increasing uh, quite substantially. Okay, so basically what's happening, prices in Spain are going up and Spain is borrowing heavily from the rest of the world who is happy lending to Spain. What's happening to the Spanish economy in the meantime that you have down here, the growth rates of Spain, this is growth rate of output, consumption and capital are very high and so the Spanish economy is booming. Now, what happens when the crisis comes? Well, many of you will remember a lot of this wealth is destroyed very quickly, so asset prices go down very rapidly. And the mirror image of that is that this current account deficit is closed quite quickly. So it's a sudden stop kind of episode where once asset prices start to fall, the rest of the world is no longer willing to lend to Spain. That's one interpretation. What happens to the Spanish economy? Well, of course, the growth rates of capital consumption and output uh, fall substantially, okay? So this is Spain. We know or we may remember the case of Spain, but Spain is not the only case. Let me show you Ireland, looks very similar. So very rapid increase in wealth. These are the same three pictures in the run up to the 2008 crisis, rapid increase of net worth to GDP. Uh, the mirror image of that is the current account deficit. So as asset prices are rising, Ireland is borrowing heavily from the rest of the world and growth in the Irish economy is very high uh, in the meantime. What happens? Well, when the crisis comes, this wealth creation is completely undone in a very short time and the current account deficit um, is reversed as well. So once asset prices fall, Ireland no longer can borrow from the rest of the world. What happens to the Irish economy? Well, growth rates uh, fall as well, okay? And the last country I want to show you is the United States, which has a very similar uh, picture. You see here in the late 90s, between 93 and 2001, basically you create a GDP of wealth very rapidly. This is the dot-com boom. There's a bust, but very quickly, this wealth figure rises again. That's the housing boom in the US, one and a half times GDP of wealth created. And the mirror image of that is the US running a large current account deficit, borrowing from the rest of the world, and relatively high growth rates of GDP, consumption, and uh, capital. What happens? Well, when the crisis comes, once again, a lot of this wealth is destroyed. By 2009, basically this wealth to GDP is at the same level it was in 95. Uh, the current account uh, deficit is reduced and growth rates fall, okay? So I could show you many examples like this. These are large economies. I mean, in Argentina, we see this quite often, okay? But, but these are large economies, developed economies, and it's quite telling. And in fact, if you look at the world, uh, you see that these countries were not alone. So what you have here, this gray bar, these gray bars that you have here is the share of countries in the world that are experiencing a credit boom in every given year. And what you see is that in the run-up to the financial crisis, by 2008, almost one-third of countries in the world were experiencing a credit boom. So they were in some kind of episode 
This is not exactly an asset boom, but they're highly correlated, so they were in some kind of episode like this. Okay? So that's a first observation, that if you will look at the last, uh, you know, I could also show you Japan in the 80s. If we look at the last 30, 40 years, these episodes have been large and very common. The other piece of evidence that's interesting is that the backdrop of that is a falling real interest rate. So that's measured here in the right axis. As all of this was happening, the real interest rate uh, was falling. Okay? So one motivation here is to think a little bit how these things are connected uh, with one another. Okay? So we have four decades of significant booms and busts uh, in asset prices, often unrelated to fundamentals. You know, you could think, well, maybe in these economies we discover new technologies or productivity is booming, but in many of these cases that was not the case, okay? In the particular case of Spain, productivity was basically flat throughout. Um, and with important macroeconomic effects. So whenever these asset prices go up, we see huge economic booms with rising investment in consumption, in output, but when asset prices fall, they often end up in crisis and in, and in uh, you know, deep recessions. And so basically, the first line of research I want to tell you about, all of this against the backdrop of low interest rates, is, well, this has led many people to talk about bubbles, you know, asset prices going up and down without uh, relationship to fundamentals, and so this suggests a number of questions. How do we think about bubbles and their effects in macroeconomic models? Why is the world like this now and maybe wasn't like this 30 or 40 years ago? And the last point is, you know, what can we say about policy? Is there a need for policy interventions in this world uh, or not? Okay? And so basically what I want to walk you through very quickly is tell you a little bit um, what this theory is about and how it works. And w the theory is fully rational, so I have here one slide of equations, okay, which is the slide after this, which has to do how we price an asset. How do we price an asset in economics? Okay, so imagine that we have a sequence of dates, zero, one, two, a number of periods, and we think that there's a market, so it's like a partial equilibrium exercise where people are willing to lend and borrow at some um, expected return of one plus R per period. And the question is, how would you price an asset that pays dividends every period, D1, D2, D3, um, et cetera, okay? So it's a very simple exercise. And here, I want to make it quick. I'm just going to assume that the asset is traded in all periods, okay? Now, how does this work? Well, what would be the price of the asset at time zero? You know, we, most of us will agree that it should look something like this. The price of the asset at time zero is the discounted return of the asset at time one. And what's the return of the asset at time one? Well, the dividend that the asset will pay and the resale price. You know, you can think of the capital gain uh, that the asset uh, will have, okay? But of course, this price at P1 also depends on the dividend at P2, okay? So this price at P1, I could say it's the expected depends on the expected dividend at time two and also on the expected price of the asset at time two. And if I replace that here, basically I'm just gonna get that the price of the asset at time zero is going to be the discounted dividends at time one at time two plus the resale price of the asset at time two, okay? Now you may say, why are you doing this? This sounds kind of standard. Well, you can do this n times and you could do this infinite times, iterated forward infinitely and you're gonna get an expression like this. Okay, and this is the only equation I will show you today. It tells you what's the price of an asset. Well, it's the discounted uh, sum of dividends. That's what we always think of the asset. This, uh, um, you know, the, depends on what the asset will pay off throughout its lifetime. But there's this term here that's left over, which is the expected price of the asset at infinity. Okay, you iterate forward. And that's if you want, what will be the resale value of this at infinity? Many times in economics, we ignore this term, we have good reasons to say, okay, this term should be zero, but basically one way to think of rational bubbles is we're not gonna impose restrictions, there's not always reasons to impose restrictions on this, so we're gonna allow this to not be zero, okay? And what does it mean intuitively, what does it mean? Well, it means that the price of an asset can have two components. The first one is the fundamental component. This is what we typically think about. It's driven by dividends, by how much the asset will pay. If I think of a firm, how productive the firm will be, the profits, whatever, okay? That's the part we typically think of. But there's this other term here that is if you want a rational bubble. It's a part that tells you the asset 
might be expensive today just because we expect that it will be expensive in the future and we can resell it in the future. Okay? Now, what do we learn from this? Asset prices have a fundamental and a bubble component. The bubble component is like a pyramid scheme. It only has value today because we expect that it will have some value in the future. That's what this means. And while we understand what pins down the fundamental, we have many models about this, productivity, cash flows. Well, this part here, what does it depend on? Well, it depends on what we expect that it will be in the future. So it just depends on expectations in a sense. Okay, so John and me in many papers, we have called this market psychology. And basically, market psychology is what drives this bubble component and that can affect the price of the asset. Okay, so the first main idea I want to tell you is that without deviating from rationality or without adding anything strange, you get very quickly to an expression like this that tells you the price of an asset depends on fundamentals and on some other component that depends on expectations. Okay? Now, why is this important? Why does this matter at all for macro, for these episodes that I was telling you about at the beginning? How can this help us understand Spain, Ireland, and so on? Okay? So one thing that we do, or that we've done in this series of research, is say, well, Take a standard macroeconomic model, macroeconomic model with credit markets, for instance, okay, where borrowing financial markets are important. Typically, these models, you have productive people that need to borrow, but when they can borrow, depends on a fraction of how wealthy they are. The value of the firm, the value of my house, if I get a mortgage, I don't know, it depends on the value of the assets I have. Okay? Now, how do these models work? There's what we call a traditional view which is that this net worth reflects the fundamentals, what I was telling you. So if I borrow against a firm, well, when the firm is productive, I can borrow more. If I'm a very productive guy and I have a very productive firm, then I'm gonna be able to get more credit to invest more, etc. okay? Now, what we do in this research is look at an alternative view, which is what I was telling you a little bit. You say, look, this net worth, which reflects the value of the assets I have, well, has a bubble component as well. And that bubble component can fluctuate driven by market psychology. And that bubble component can have large movements that are unexplained by fundamentals. And this opens the door to have large shocks to wealth. Okay, so this can move around a lot when beliefs, when expectations move around a lot. Okay, and this gives rise to the first point I wanna show you, which is what we call the wealth effects of bubbles. What does it mean? Imagine I go to the bank, I have a firm, I want to get a loan. But the bank, what it will lend me, depends on my net worth, depends on the value of my assets. Now, what I'm telling you is that the value of these assets could fluctuate because of beliefs or expectations. When we are optimistic, the value of assets goes up because the bubble component goes up and therefore people can borrow more and therefore this will drive investment, will drive output, etc. That's a little bit the simple idea, okay? And this is what we call the wealth effects of bubbles because if I happen to be lucky enough to have a bubble, then I'm able to borrow more and to invest more and basically makes me wealthier, okay? So this is the first insight. I'm gonna put a few simple insights in red. So if you take nothing away from this talk, you can remember these insights. The first insight is that bubbles can have large macroeconomic effects, okay? It can lead to large fluctuations in asset prices unrelated to fundamentals, and it can lead to boom bust cycles in investment, in credit, and in output. Why is this important? Well, because of what I told you at the beginning. Many times in macro, we see these large fluctuations and we struggle to really explain them through fundamentals. Oh, what drove this huge increase of prices in Spain? Was it productivity? Well, we don't see it in productivity. What changed really in the Spanish economy? This tells you, well, even if nothing changed fundamentally, you can have large fluctuations in asset prices and this can lead to large fluctuations in credit, in investment, in output, etc. okay? So let me show you an example. This is from a simple, very simple macro model where there's nothing stochastic. It's for a small open economy. I want to show you just this picture, which doesn't tell you much because uh, you will see in a second why this is relevant. And here you have an economy where the capital stock we are plotting here goes up, down, up, down, up, down, but nothing fundamental is changing in the economy. It's a simulation where market psychology fluctuates and sometimes we're very optimistic, asset prices go up and the economy booms. And sometimes we're pessimistic, asset prices drops, and the economy uh, contracts, okay? Now, what's interesting about this? 
Imagine I zoom into one of these episodes here where asset prices are booming. What does the economy look like? Well, here I show you these pictures from the model, and of course the idea is to make the case that they look not unlike the events I showed you for Spain, Ireland, and the US. Okay? What you see here is, what does the wealth of the economy look like? Well, we have some constant level of wealth, but then the bubbly episode begins. This is a world where firms, the bubble is attached to firms, the value of firms goes up, entrepreneurs can borrow more, and they become wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. What happens to the economy if you look at the current account? Well, the fact that all the productive guys in this economy are borrowing more because they're richer means that there's a lot of capital inflow into this economy. The rest of the world is willing to lend because the value of assets in this economy is very high. What happens to the economy as it booms? Well, these are the growth rates of capital output and consumption. They're all going up relative to normal times, let's say. Okay? So what's the insight here? Nothing fundamental is changing in the economy. It's just, you know, some self-fulfilling expectations that drives asset prices, and asset prices is driving everything else. What happens when this bubbly episode ends? This optimism disappears. Well, asset prices in the economy start to go down. This means that entrepreneurs cannot borrow as much as before, and therefore the rest of the world, when you look at it, is not willing to lend as much as at this economy, so this current account deficit disappears. What happens to the growth rate of capital and output when the episode ends? Well, the growth rate, of course, uh, falls. Okay? So the first insight I would say is that this is a very simple way of thinking about these episodes, of opening the door to large fluctuations without having any shocks to fundamental um, in the economy. Okay? Now, this is an example for a tiny economy. You could ask yourself, but when? If you think of the world as a whole, when are bubbles likely? Why are bubbles likelier now than they were in the past, if such a thing is true? Okay? And so here, one way to view it, I'm going to show you some data in a second, but let me show you first, make a, a slightly conceptual point. You can say, imagine you have an economy now, a model of the world economy, with many, many countries, now, what's the difference with the previous world? Now, in a sense, the economy has to close. Everything we're saving in this world, someone has to be borrowing it or investing it somewhere. Okay? And so you can think of this world as having two types of agents. Some agents are productive. You can think of these as entrepreneurs. And these productive guys are going to be able to borrow up to some value of their assets, what their assets allow them to borrow. After these guys, they cannot borrow anymore, well, someone else will have to borrow, and you have less and less productive guys borrowing um, at the margin, okay? So the idea here is to say, imagine we have productive guys and unproductive guys. We have some companies in the world that are extremely productive, but there's a limit to how much they can borrow. It depends on the value of their assets. Once these guys borrow enough, well, some, the rest of companies will have to, uh, savings will have to be redirected to other types of agents, other types of companies. Okay. Now, what happens in this world? What happens if you have a kind of bubbly episode of exuberance of boom that raises asset prices? Well, you have two effects of bubbles now. One effect is the one I just told you. There will be a wealth effect. When asset prices go up, these productive guys will be able to borrow more. That's the same as before. But now in equilibrium, there's also an offsetting effect we call it the overhang effects of bubbles, because the fact that companies are overvalued is also going to mean in equilibrium that someone needs to buy these overvalued assets instead of, you know, lending, uh, instead of investing uh, productively. Okay? So the insight here is the following. You have a basic wealth effect. When asset prices go up, we're all richer, we can borrow more. But the fact that assets are, are expensive means that we have to devote resources to buying these assets, and that's going to crowd out some investment in equilibrium, okay? So here, the effects are a bit um, more nuanced, um, if you want. Okay. So now, this, this brings me to the main point that I, I want to tell you, which is, once you think of the world economy like this, when are these bubbly episodes possible, okay? Now, loosely speaking, 
what you need for bubbles to exist is low interest rates. And this is the link to the data that I showed you at the beginning. What is the reason for this? Think of the following. I told you that the bubble is an overvaluation attached to the asset, like a pyramid scheme. In order for that to exist in equilibrium, that bubble, in order to be attractive, needs to give me a rate of return that is at least as high as the rate of interest. Okay? Otherwise, people wouldn't be willing to hold it. Otherwise, people would not value it. But on the other hand, the bubble cannot outgrow the economy because if it did, eventually the asset values would be so high that we wouldn't have enough resources to buy them. Okay? So the idea here is the following. Imagine I buy an overvalued, imagine I hold one of these bubbles. That bubble component needs to grow at least as high as the interest rate or otherwise I would not value it. But on the other hand, if it grows too fast, eventually all of the resources that we have would not be enough to buy this bubble and this bubble could not be feasible in equilibrium. And this tells you that in order for bubbles to arise in our standard macro models, the interest rate needs to be low. That's when these overvaluations will tend to be likely. Okay? Now, when is the interest rate low? What does it mean for the interest rate to be low? Well, you can take two views here. One is that the interest rate reflects somehow the return to investment. And so a low interest rate simply means that the marginal return to investment is very low. Another view is that the interest rate is low because of these financial frictions that I was telling you about because of borrowing constraints. Okay, so what's the idea here? The intuition is the following. Imagine I have a world where I have some very productive people out there, very productive investment opportunities, but they cannot borrow a lot because maybe they're poor. Okay? And we're not going to lend to them unless they have assets to pledge when they borrow. Now, what will this do? This will depress how much these people can pay for whatever it is that they borrow, and this will lead to a depressed interest rate in equilibrium. Okay? So the bottom line here, the main takeaway I want to tell you here is the following. In order for bubbles to exist, you need low interest rates. Why can interest rates be low? Well, either because the return to capital is very low or because financial frictions are uh, very severe. They're binding and they depress the interest rate. Do we have any, um, do we have any, you know, why would we believe the latter in the world? Let me show you. So the two insights I want you to take away from here is that bubbles are possible in low interest rate environments. That's number one. And number two, that financial frictions relax the conditions for the existence of bubbles. So if we live in a world where financial frictions are very tight, that will reduce the interest rate and that will open up the door for these bubbles to arise. Okay? So let me show you just some data. This is for the euro area. What you see here, the red line here is the interest rate, the real short-term interest rate for the euro area. And that's exactly a parallel of the picture I was showing you before. That interest rate has been falling steadily for the last 30 years or so. The blue line here is an estimate of the return to capital, if you want, the return to investment in the euro area economy over the last 30 years or so. Okay? What is this meant to show you? Well, in a world where the interest rate reflected the return to investment, these two lines would be very close to one another and wo both would have been declining. That would be a world where the interest rate is falling because investment is becoming less productive. Okay. When we look at the data, that doesn't seem to have been the case. The interest rate has been falling, but if you look at the return to investment, maybe it has fallen a little, but not nearly as much. Okay? And this suggests that we live in a world where interest rates have declined a lot, not because the return to investment has declined a lot, but there's something else operating in the middle that's reducing interest rates, even though the return to investment is, uh, has been more or less um, stable. Okay? Are you guys with me? More or less? Okay. Huh? Fully, I don't believe, but uh, partially, partially I will take. Okay, now, what's the idea? What's the idea here? Now is the time where I want to tell you how this theory can help us understand the world, okay? So what I've told you so far 
is that bubbles are possible. Assets can be, the value of assets can be different from fundamentals, from what fundamentals would tell us. And this is especially true in environments where the interest rate is low. Okay? Now, what does this have to do with the world we live in? What does this have to do with the world we live in? And so now let me tell you a story that puts this theory together. Um, and it's going to tie all of these phenomena that we're seeing in Ireland, in Spain, in uh, the US, to the process of financial globalization that we've been seeing over the last 40 years. Okay? So you have here a brief history of financial globalization. In the 1970s, industrial countries, they lifted restrictions to capital flows and they integrate to a global financial market. In the 1980s, industrial countries deregulate financial markets and liberalize other features of their domestic markets. And in the 1990s, emerging markets followed suit and they also uh, joined the world, uh, the international financial market. So here you have some data. This is the, a measure of financial integration of advanced economies. Basically, it's foreign assets plus foreign liabilities divided by GDP. So when this is going up, it means that countries have a lot of foreign assets and foreign liabilities. It means they're becoming more and more integrated, according to some measure, to the rest of the world. This is for advanced economies, and you see that this is steadily increasing from the 1980s uh, onwards. Okay? Now, what about emerging markets? Well, emerging markets took a bit longer. You see they stagnate a bit in the 80s, whatever, but then financial liberalization takes off for them as well, and this integration to the rest of the world increases um, as well. What's the flip side of this greater financial integration? So I want you to think of a world financial market where more and more countries are coming in. And what's happening to the world economy as more and more countries are coming in? Well, interest rates are going down. I already showed you that. I will show you again the picture in a second. We see an increased frequency of credit booms and busts. I showed you that at the beginning, but I will show it to you again. We have a lot of savings that now in this global market, they move around the world, basically, you know, fairly freely. These capital flows are quite volatile. So we have large capital surges and sudden stops. And we have what I, what many people call global imbalances, which I will explain to you in a second. Okay, so let me show you a few pictures that, um, captures each of these different topics. The first one is the same picture I showed you before. So we had this process of financial integration. When you look at booms and busts in the world, this incidence of booms and busts is increasing. And at the same time, the world real interest rate is falling. Okay, so you can think of this as a world where booms and busts are becoming more and more common against the backdrop of a falling interest rate. If you look at capital flows, Fernando will recognize this because it comes from one of his papers. Okay, what you see here, this is uh, gross capital inflows and outflows of different economies over, you know, the last, from 1970 onwards. And the only thing I want to show you here is that capital flows are increasing, take the US, so gross capital inflows and gross capital outflows are increasing. This is another measure of the US becoming more and more integrated, but they're also very volatile, okay? Every time there's a crisis, you see that these fall a lot, and then they recover and they rise very quickly. You have, for instance, here Argentina during the 90s, large increase in capital flows, but then there's a sudden stop and both cross inflows, cross outflows, they both fall, okay? So capital flows are large, but they're also very volatile. Now, the other piece of evidence that's interesting is these global imbalances, okay? What do you see here? This is a picture which I took from a, you know, an IMF World Economic Outlook. It's a bit update, outdated, but it, it really points what I want to show you, which is the following. What you see here is countries that have current account surpluses, so they're lending to the rest of the world. This is on the positive. And countries that have current account deficit, so that they're borrowing from the rest of the world. What you see here, this goes from 1870 to the early 2000s, is the first wave of financial globalization in the late 19th century. There, we also had a lot of capital flows. Who is the country that's lending a lot up here with a huge current account deficit of 8% of GDP? Well, that's the UK, okay? The UK was the capital financial center of the world, lots of capital exporting it to the rest of the world. Who were the big deficit countries? Well, I don't have them here, but they would be Argentina, Canada, Australia, countries that had a lot of land, they were growing very quickly and they were building railroads, ports, infrastructure. So 
these were the large deficit countries. So we had capital flows from the UK to these countries that were growing very fast, and that's exactly, in a sense, what you would expect financial integration to do, okay? Then you have the world wars, then you have the Bretton Woods, not much happening here in terms of deficits and surpluses, capital flows are very small, and then look what happens. This new era of financial integration begins, the one I'm telling you about, and once again, these surpluses and deficits, they open up again. So we have countries that are lending to the rest of the world and countries that are borrowing a lot from the rest of the world. Now, what's the interesting thing? Which is the country here with the biggest current account surplus in this chart? That's China, okay? What's the country with the biggest current account deficit here? Is the United States. So that's kind of puzzling. In the past, we had capital flowing from capital rich to capital poor economies. It's what we would expect. If you look at recent years, well, China is a kind of capital poor economy, but it's lending to the US, which is a capital rich economy. Okay? And so on top of these large capital flows, on top of the fact that they're very volatile, well, they don't seem to be going in the right uh, direction. Okay? I can show you a more detailed picture. This is current account deficit and surpluses. Now I show you the US. This is between the early 90s and let's say 2015 against China and oil producing countries. And you see here that it's basically China and the oil producers. They have a current account surplus and they're basically lending to the US that has a large current account deficit. Okay? So how do we make sense of all this? What does this have to do with the bubbles and with the Ireland's and the Spain's and the US? and what's going on there. So this is a little bit what I want to tie down now, okay? Now, how do we think of this? How do we think of China lending to the rest of the world? I put here as a joke three views. You know, why is this happening? The first view is that China is evil, in a sense, okay? So this is the view of many politicians like Trump. They say, well, China is doing crazy things, manipulating stuff. That's why they have this large current account uh, surplus. There's another view, which I call here the traditional view, which tells you actually this all originates in the US. The US is borrowing like crazy from the rest of the world. They have unsustainable policies, consumption, government spending, whatever. This cannot go on for a long time, okay? This was the view of Opsfeld and Rogoff before the financial crisis. They were saying, look, this large deficit will end in a crisis. But there's a third view, which is the one I want to show you here, which relates to what I, how I started the talk, which is, Look, this is natural given that we are putting together countries with very different levels of financial development. Some countries like the US have very advanced financial markets. Some countries like China don't have very advanced financial markets. So what's gonna happen in this world? Well, the Chinas of the world are growing very fast. They're generating a lot of savings, but they don't have assets to put these savings in. So they're looking for assets. Where are these assets? Well, in the West, in the US, in Spain, in Ireland, and so the capital flows looking for these assets, okay? So this is a view that tells you that this integration with, chi with the Chinas of the world has reduced interest rates, possibly opened the door to bubbles, and led to large capital flows to the West, which is where assets are produced, okay? So let me show you this picture. This is a bit outdated, but I really love it because it says in one picture, the story I want to tell. What does this picture tell us? It's the following. It tells you for each of these emerging markets, you add up the total market cap of their stock market, and it tells you what US company is worth as much as the entire market, okay? So this is a bit old. I should update it, but I took it from The Economist. Uh, but look at Turkey. Turkey is a big emerging economy. What does this tell you? There's 55 companies listed in the Turkish stock market. You add up their entire market capitalization and it's equal to the value of Starbucks, okay? So not very impressive, okay? You take Chile, Chile is like the miracle of Latin America. You add up all the market cap of Chilean stock market and they're worth as much as Costco, which is a supermarket chain, okay? So what is this picture saying in a nutshell? It's telling you, look, I go to, I go to Brazil and Brazil, you know, it's a large emerging market. Maybe it's growing very fast. Maybe it has a lot of potential in the future. But we cannot trade that potential today. It's not traded in the market. Why? Well, because to produce assets, you need a lot of stuff. You need property rights. You need good financial infrastructure. Maybe these countries are not, you know, they don't have that. 
So when these countries join the world financial market, they bring a lot of savings, but they don't bring the assets. Where do these savings go? Well, they go and buy the US stock market, they go and buy houses in Spain, they go and buy assets in places that can produce them, in a sense. Okay? So, basically, let me tell you a brief story. One story that we've developed with Jaume in, in one of the papers, and I will tell the story, I don't want to go into details, is a story where before financial integration, think of a world that has a core and a periphery. The core is advanced economies. They can produce assets. They have relatively good financial markets. But the periphery, they cannot produce assets. And initially, if you go back to the 1980s, the core is integrated. We have a core financial market, but the periphery has not yet integrated. What does that world look like? Well, if you look at the core, because financial markets are developed, because we have a lot of intermediation in the core, interest rates are relatively high. Basically, interest rates more or less reflect the return to investment. So interest rates are not very low. And so bubbles cannot be possible in that world because interest rates are too high. Okay? If you look at periphery, well, there, forget it. They don't even have financial markets, so forget bubbles. They, they don't have bubbles in the periphery either. Okay, so before financial integration, we have a world where asset prices reflect fundamentals both in the core and in the periphery. And therefore, it's what we call a tranquil world because it's a world where you don't have a lot of volatility because fundamentals are not jumping around like crazy. Okay, so asset prices more or less track fundamentals. They're fairly stable. What happens when you bring the periphery into the world market? Well, it's exactly what I was telling you. From 1990s onward, the periphery joins the world financial market. What's gonna happen? These guys bring a lot of savings, but very little assets, so very little borrowing, and therefore the world interest rate will fall. The world interest rate will fall because periphery savers are lending a lot to core entrepreneurs, okay? And capital, therefore, will flow from periphery to core, and this will boost the capital stock in core. Okay, so who is the periphery in my language? Well, it's the Chinas, it's the oil producers. These are emerging markets, you know, oil producers, Price of oil is very high. They're generating a lot of resources, but where do they invest these resources? Well, in the UK, in the US, etc. Okay? So what's the insight of this uh, story? Well, we went from a world where bubbles were not possible, not in the periphery because they don't have financial markets, not in the core because there the interest rate was relatively high, to a world where now financial integration led to a fall in the interest rate, and now bubbles are possible in the core. Okay, so when you integrate, bubbles will appear in the core. They reinforce the effects of financial globalization. What does it mean? Whenever I see a bubble in the UK, well, there will be more capital flow to the UK. Remember the picture I showed you, they go hand in hand. So more bubble, more capital flows. Capital flows sustained by the bubble are volatile because when asset prices go up and down, capital flows will go up and down. And also bubbles may lead to dispersion within the core. What does it mean? Well. Maybe the bubble appears in Spain, and Spain starts growing very fast relative to its neighbors. But if the bubble appears in the US, the US will start growing very fast relative to its neighbors. We don't know where the bubble will appear, but the bubble will generate dispersion. Okay? So, let me, you know, this is like in a simple model, what would this look like? Imagine I have two countries in the core. This could be the US and Spain. These red lines show what would happen without bubble. This is a very simple world where you don't have any shocks to fundamentals. So everything would be very stable. The capital stock in both countries would be flat and the current account deficit in both countries would be flat. What happens once bubbles appear? Well, you have these bubbles that are driven by expectations in country one, in country two, asset prices are moving around. What is the current account deficit of both countries doing now? Well, it's also moving around. When asset prices are high, they borrow a lot. When asset prices are low, you have a sudden stop. What happens to the capital stock in both countries, to economic growth? Well, it's gonna track a little bit the evolution of these bubbles, okay? So this is a theory that tells you, once again, we go from a world, paradoxically, financial integration has made the world look like financial frictions are bigger because we brought in a lot of people that have savings but don't have financial markets. This depresses the world interest rate and opens the door to these bubbly episodes, to this uh, volatility. Okay, now, uh, what can we do? Is there a role in this theory for policy? Okay, so we've explored this 
in a number of papers, the idea would be, imagine what world would you like to live in? Imagine you have a theory like this that tells you asset prices might be high or asset prices might be low. We don't know. Imagine you could choose what world you want to live in. Well, it's very clear if you think about it a little bit that if we could choose, we'd want to live in a world where asset prices are high and stable. That's the best possible world. We would all be richer, we could all borrow a lot, and you know, as long as we can guarantee that prices would be stable, this would be a very nice world to live in. Okay? But of course, we cannot guarantee that. I told you that these asset prices, they move around with expectations, with beliefs, with market psychology. We cannot control this market psychology. Okay? But one thing that we've explored is, well, could governments somehow, by intervening in financial markets, obtain the same result that you would with these high and stable prices. Okay? And the answer is yes. In, the, in theory, of course, this is relatively simple. In practice, uh, it's not. Okay? In theory, what does this look like? It tells you, well, if the problem is that asset prices are moving around, well, let me compensate people to offset these fluctuations in asset prices. So one way to think about it is, look, if the bubble I observe is too small relative to the one I would want, asset prices are too low, I'll subsidize these entrepreneurs so that they can borrow. Fine, no problem. What about if the bubble is too large relative to what I would like? Asset prices are too high relative to what I would want. Well, I'll tax them. And by subsidizing and taxing them, I can more or less regulate credit and stabilize it at the level that I would want with high and stable asset prices. Okay? So, what's the interpretation of this? You can think of this as a credit management policy. Sometimes, Asset prices in the economy are depressed. The government could say, no problem, I will guarantee credit, you give it out. Sometimes, asset prices in the economy are too high. The government could say, no problem, I will tax it away and reduce the lending. And I will stabilize credit at the level um, that I would want. These policies have two features that are very nice. First, you can show theoretically that you can implement exactly the outcome that you would want of, of the bubble that you would like with high and stable asset prices. And the other thing is that you can do that in an expectationally robust way. What does it mean, expectationally robust? Well, this is a world where expectations are moving around. So you want to make sure that your policy works even if expectations are moving around. Okay? And you can show that, in fact, the policy, you can stabilize the credit regardless of what expectations are doing and so on. So it's fairly powerful within our simple models. Now, of course, you might tell me, look, when you go to reality, things are quite complicated, okay? So the main insight I want to tell you here is that in theory, principle can, in, in, in principle, or in theory, policy can manage bubbles, but there's a lot of caveats. For instance, to do that, you may need to issue a lot of debt. How is the government gonna fund these subsidies? And once you issue debt, maybe, you know, debt will be prone to many problems as well, okay? So you may have problems of commitment, of repayment, of rollover crisis, and so on and so forth. So there's many issues there that are interesting um, to think about. So I want to say two things before I finish, which are the followings. First, let me just give you a takeaway, which is that this view of bubbles, I think, has been very fruitful to think about asset booms and busts and their macroeconomic effects. Many macroeconomists have explored and are exploring multiple variations of this theory to think about monetary policy, bailouts, banking crisis, information production, and so on. But there's a number of pending questions. Two that I think are particularly relevant is about number one, equilibrium selection. That's more conceptual. You know, this is a theory that tells you market psychology can move around. How do we select the right market psychology? How can we discipline ourselves to select a market psychology? That's a very important question to which we don't have an answer. The second one is how do we measure or quantify these bubbles in practice? Not every time asset prices go up, it's really a bubble, okay? So some people are making progress. I want to show you one chart. This is from a recent paper by Paulo Guerron Quintana. And basically what he does is he, have a, he has a quantitative version of the theory I just showed you here, very similar. But you grab a big model, you put numbers in it, and then you ask yourself, if I put US data in a model, What's the likelihood that given that I can observe US output, given that I can observe asset prices, what's the likelihood that we have a bubble in the US economy? And the model tells you, you see what I'm plotting here is what's the likelihood that the US economy is in a bubble in any one of these years. 
And you see the model tells you things that, you know, maybe you don't need to be a genius to, to understand. In 2007, yes, the probability that you were in a bubble is extremely high. Okay, thank you, we knew that, okay. 2001, same thing. But the model tells you other interesting things. You know, in the late 80s, it seems also that the likelihood that the US economy was in a bubble is, was very high. In 2015, actually this rose a bit, then it came down. What is driving this probability? Well, I don't wanna go too much into the methodology, but basically remember, a bubble is when asset prices go up and it's not justified by fundamentals. So that's what's happening here. You're feeding in information about US productivity, um, uh, US asset prices and so on, and the model is telling you every time I see asset prices go up and I don't see a big change in productivity, well, I'm gonna increase the likelihood that we have a bubble, okay? So the only thing I want to tell you is that at a conceptual level, we understand some of these things fairly well, but there's still a lot of progress to be made in the measurement and some people are doing that. Let me skip this one and I, I have a few minutes left, no? Or I want to spend the last part talking about debt, which is related to this phenomenon here because you could think, you could think that, you know, one way to interpret the European debt crisis is that, you know, many of these countries had an asset bubble that led them to grow, say Spain, a real estate bubble. Then that bubble burst, and what governments tried to do was, in a sense, reconstruct that bubble by issuing debt, try to stimulate the economy once the bubble burst by issuing debt, in a sense, okay? So what you see here is public debt as a percentage of GDP for Spain, Italy, Ireland, Portugal, and Greece. So these were like the southern European economies that eventually got into trouble. And what you see here is that in the aftermath, up to 2007, these ratios were stable or declining. And after the financial crisis of 2007 and 8, these debt ratios start to rise pretty much across the board uh, in these countries. Okay, so these countries, basically, once again, they suffer a crisis, they start issuing debt, trying to make up for it. What happens to the interest rate on this debt? So these are the spreads. You see, initially, they were very flat. So basically, you see that this was as safe as German debt. But shortly after they start to increase these debt ratios, Europe had a crisis. How do we see that here? These spreads, the interest rate on this debt um, started to rise um, in these southern uh, economies. Okay? And here comes the perhaps most interesting part, which is as the interest rate on this debt was rising, actually this debt was coming back home in a sense, okay? It was being bought by domestics. So let me explain to you this chart here, spend some time explaining this chart here for Spain. What does this chart tell us? You have here, what share of Spanish debt is held by residents, that's the black line. What share is held by non-residents, that's the red line, okay? So the black line tells you the share of Spanish debt that is in the hands of Spanish people. And the red line tells you the share of debt that is in the hands of foreigners. What do we see? Well, as the world is becoming financially integrated, and remember, peripheries demanding core assets, remember the story I was telling you? Well, part of these assets are public debt, public debt of Spain, which is safe. Here you have the spread, so the spread is very low. So the Chinas of the world, the emerging markets of the world are buying up Western assets, and among them, it's debt, some of it from the euro area, okay? So, you see that foreigners initially hold 30% of Spanish debt. This is rising, rising, rising. It peaks at about 50-50. So if you go back to 2006, about 50% of the debt is in the hands of Spaniards, 50% is in the hands of foreigners, okay? Now, what starts to happen as the spread on Spanish debt starts to rise? That, that's, that's that lash, dash line here, okay? Spanish debt starts to become risky. Well, you see here what happens, these foreigners, that wanted this Spanish debt, they no longer want it, so they start to flee. As I say here, they start to leave the economy. So this share starts to fall, and who is buying this debt? Of course, the complement of this is the Spaniards, okay? And so the debt becomes risky. If you have a view of diversification, you would say, well, Spain is becoming risky, all the Spaniards live in Spain. There's no reason why they should buy more Spanish debt, okay, if you just think of diversification. But that's exactly what's happening here. You see foreigners, they're leaving, 
you know, some of this is in the primary market, some of this is debt they're selling off in the primary market, and who's buying the debt? The Spanish. If you look at Germany, that remains safe throughout, you don't see this, okay? You see that this share of German debt held by residents keeps falling monotonically, and basically, an increasing share of German debt is in the hands of the rest of the world, okay? Now, what's interesting about this? This led us, actually, Fernando and Jaume are here, but with Fernando, Jaume, Nicola Genayoni, other colleagues, Basically, we thought a lot about this, and one key insight here is to think about the distribution of debt ownership as a very important variable to think about uh, sovereign risk, okay? It has very important implications for a number of reasons, but the main one being that, you know, you could think that when the debt is in the hands of domestic residents, the cost of defaulting are higher, so all else equal, you're less likely to default, okay? Japan is like the poster child for this. It's the country with the highest debt in the world, has about 260% debt to GDP ratio, but it's all in the hands of domestics, okay? So it has a very low interest rates. Why? Well, it's unlikely that the Japanese government will default, you know, for a number of reasons, but especially because all the debt is held by Japanese, okay? So one way to view this phenomenon is that as long as the debt is safe, foreigners are willing to hold it, but as soon as it may become risky, they run away the debt falls in the hands of Spaniards, and that's what we see here, okay? Now, this has a number of interesting implications. The distribution of debt, number one, the distribution of debt is key to think about sovereign risk. Number two, this distribution of debt is not constant. It can change very quickly, precisely because of trading in the secondary market. And what happens when debt comes back home? Well, it has a number of implications that are all very important. The first one is it has potentially the increases, it has the potential to increase the incentives to repay, as I was saying, but it also generates costs. Number one, one thing that we looked at with Fernando Jaume and Aitor Erse is that when the debt comes back home, that also hurts the domestic economy because the foreigners are leaving, domestic banks, a lot of this debt is being bought by domestic banks, you know, maybe like La Caixa or Santander or whoever. When these banks buy the debt, they're buying up debt instead of lending to firms. So you're in a crisis, credit is already scarce, foreigners are leaving, they're dumping the debt on domestic banks, and therefore this may further reduce credit and further exacerbate the crisis. So you have a tension here, because on the one hand you may increase the incentives to repay, on the other hand you may hurt the domestic economy, and it also means that if eventually the default does materialize, well, the domestic economy can suffer a lot, okay? This is what you know, people in policy circles call the sovereign bank nexus, which is by the time the crisis comes, your banks are full of domestic debt, and then when you default, you take down the banks with you, okay? So this is a research that I also think was, you know, is quite insightful. In fact, the two years I spent at the IMF, it was mentioned earlier, there was a whole working group on debt restructuring and also on the sovereign bank nexus and how to manage it, and a lot of the insights were coming from papers like this, thinking about how this distribution of debt um, is determined in the market and whether you want to regulate it somehow, whether it's optimal or not, you know. Is it a good idea to have banks buying so much debt? Well, on the one hand, it increases incentives to repay, so that's a good thing. On the other hand, it may have entail a lot of costs for domestic economies, okay? So there's interesting regulatory aspects um, there. So maybe I should wrap up, no? Because so I wanted to tell you one more thing, but I will skip it. Um, I will skip this. So to conclude, what have I, and I say we because many co-authors have worked with me on this, what have I learned, you know, what do I know today that maybe I didn't know 10 or 15 years ago before writing all these papers, okay? So a, a number of things. First of all is to think about recent decades and how important it has been to understand this process of financial globalization as the fact that we're integrating economies with many different levels of financial development. That seems to me like a very important fact, and this gives you the notion that we have all these savings moving around the world and generates or is associated to these global imbalances, as I mentioned, okay? Now, this has contributed to the falling world interest rates, and this itself has had a number of implications. Number one, it opened the door to bubbles in the core. So basically Western Europe and the US. This has led to higher frequency of credit booms and busts. And it had also 
has also led to very volatile capital flows, capital flow surges and uh, sudden stops. Number two, when bubble bursts, governments have tried to replace them with public debt. In some cases, this has worked, you could say, because then, you know, it all depends on beliefs, on whether people believe you, whether you're credible or not, but many countries could not do it. They could not pull it off. And as spreads increased for those countries that could not pull it off, so did the debt in the hands of domestics. This has very strong effects, or substantial effects, I should say, on both the incentives to repay and on the costs of default themselves. Okay, so to think about sovereign risk and so on. And I also wanted to tell you one last point that I had no time, but these low interest rates have potentially also hurt the allocation of resources and the growth of productivity in the core because low interest rates have fostered relatively inefficient investment and firms. And so we have another line of research where we've um, explored that. And maybe with this, I'll just shut up and uh, open the door to see if there's questions or comments. Okay, thank you. Questions? Does anyone of oh, comments? Does anyone want to have a question other than shutting down the borders? <laughs> <laughs> no, so relative to that, let me I was gonna say, right? Because no, but it's they impl almost imp so I mean I know it doesn't imply that, but no, because it it's true, you know, another thing that maybe I should have stressed here is the following. We tend to think that bubbles are bad. But actually, the countries here that receive the bubble, to some extent, they benefit a lot. You know, if you have a bubble in your country, your asset prices go up, and who owns these assets? Well, largely us who live in the country, so we all become richer. We all can borrow more. We all can invest more. Now, there's a cost to that, potentially, okay? Because when the bubble bursts, you can have a large crisis. So you generate more volatility, but the implication is not necessarily that you want to close down your borders and and uh, avoid them altogether, in a sense. Okay. Well, in terms of welfare of uh, citizens, no? Like bubbles and uh, like a strong cycle has a lot of- Absolutely. Impact. So you may want to regulate the cycle, but once again, but you also benefit because basically you live in a world of higher asset prices, which are more volatile. So that has a silver lining to it and a bad aspect to it. So you, of course, you may want to think about regulation, about how to deal with the cycle and so on. But it's not at all obvious, and I would say what comes out in most models is that you know it's not true that you would want to kill them fully, in a sense. Okay, that's it. Any other questions? Jordi? Do we have the microphone? It's coming. Good, thank you. <clears throat> Very nice uh, overview. Uh, but just one piece of evidence that I cannot fit in the yeah. in the whole puzzle. When you showed that the um, um, marginal return to investment yeah. was rema was remaining relatively flat mm -hmm. while interest rates were going down, then one explanation the explanation you gave had to do well the, for interest rates. You gave the explanation of. Uh, global inter fin integra mm -hmm. integration of financial markets. But shouldn't that it's in itself have uh, brought down also the return to, to investment? I mean, this, this uh, if especially under your view in which the bubble to which this savings from China and so on are alloc uh, um, is allocated is a bubble that is connected to ac uh, accumulation mm -hmm. of capital. No. That's right. So, that's right. So maybe the picture I showed you, you know, there's an issue of how to compute this return to capital from aggregate data. So here I just wanted to motivate, but you're right that in a sense that picture looks too flat for the story I'm telling. Now, the fact that the wedge itself would increase, that is totally consistent with the story I'm telling. So you're absolutely right that what we would expect is that it would have fallen but it would have fallen less than the interest rate. So when you go back in time, they would be equal to one another, 
and today the wedge would be larger. I, I totally agree with that. So if um, there is no more comments, then we can maybe uh, close the yep. ceremony. And we have uh, outside uh, a little, I hope, <laughs> a little glass of cava for everyone to celebrate. And I also want to take this opportunity to uh, announce that uh, there will be, of course, another call. So as uh, Elisenda was reading, the price has move from the annual to annual uh, following, so the Junta, at that time, uh, Jordi Galli was still the president, and Jordi Galli and the Junta decided to uh, move the price to annual uh, following the advice of the jurat. I, por qué me estic parlant en anglès? <laughs> Disculpa, Teo, Alberto. Total, <laughs> um, el, el, el premi a partir d'ara serà anual, i el, tot rebreu la l'anunci per presentar candidatures, també hi haurà, igual que en l'anterior la, eh, convocatòria, també hi haurà un comitè de, de, de nominacions, a més a més del jurat. Igual que aquest any, eh, les candidatures es podran presentar a finals, a finals de setembre del 2024 i la dotació del premi serà eh, aquesta peça artística eh, que jo trobo preciosa i a més a més, igual que aquest any, 5.000 euros eh, pel candidat. Moltes gràcies, és un honor que hagis guanyat aquest premi i gràcies a tothom per assistir.